Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. This is Cola Day's weekly column. August 27th, 2015. Only revolution can mitigate climate change. Fred Hampton, the assassinated Black Panther, once famously said, School is not important, and work is not important. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism, because fascism will stop us all. That quotation has been running through my mind lately, as I have been reading about climate change. Replace fascism with climate change, and you have a spot-on description of the state of the world today. Things have gotten that dire. Before you accuse me of misappropriating Hampton, let me point out that climate change is fascism. Fascism made manifest, ecologically, at the global scale. And actually, I would expand Hampton's scope so that us includes all the non-human life on Earth, its ecosystems, and even the soil beneath our feet. The amazing web of life, made up of all our relations, as the Native Americans put it, is the us that the fascism-induced climate change is stopping. This is not a doom and gloom essay. Instead, I will picture what meaningful action would look like. Suffice it to say here that the scientific jury is in, and the verdict is clear. The world as we have known it is passing away. Relative climate stability is being replaced by volatility and extremes, and it will only get worse. The ways that we provide food, shelter, and other necessities for ourselves will not be viable for much longer. If this planet and its residents are going to survive, we humans need to abandon our current lifestyles and create new ways of living. Indisputably, Hampton was right to call for revolution in 1969. We would be right to call for another one now. If we do not, climate change will indeed stop us all. I know that revolution is a big word. Can't we just take this slowly, step by step, utilizing new technologies to make things better? The answer is no. Further attempts to use the tools of civilization to address a predicament created by civilization cannot be expected to succeed. Put another way, it is impossible to change the system from within. We can no longer afford to depend on fossil fuels and industrial technology. The fact that we got ourselves into this situation in the first place shows that we never really could. Proposals to make our current living patterns, quote, sustainable with, quote, renewables are fantasies. More simplicity is the answer, not more complexity. We must speak of returning, not progressing. John Michael Greer recently wrote, quote, If it's going to be necessary to change things, and it is, then it's time to start thinking about options for the future that don't consist of maintaining a miserably unsatisfactory status quo or continuing along a trajectory that's clearly headed towards something even worse. The first step in making change is imagining change, and the first step in imagining change is recognizing that more of the same isn't going to cut it, end quote. I agree. So what will this revolution look like? What are some of the changes that we must make? That is, what is, quote, not important and what must be, quote, stopped? For starters, school and work. Just like Hampton said, Money must no longer be required for housing, food, water, essential medical care, or the education needed in the new times. All debt will be forgiven and no new debt created. Everyone must be freed from worries about how to pay for the necessities of living so we can focus together on the tasks at hand. Capitalism, the set of social relations currently entrapping us, must be extinguished to reveal the cooperativeness endemic to our species. The fire sectors, that is, finance, insurance, and real estate. I would call them leeches, but I don't want to insult the innocent, segmented worms of the phylum Analyta, who are only following their own nature. Will anyone miss the bankers, actuaries, and underwriters when they're gone? It seems doubtful. Will there be a place for them in a world where we are concerned about the actual rather than the abstract? No. For too long, they have sucked up real resources for their own enrichment to the detriment of us all. The U.S. Military This is the monster that makes the U.S. quote the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and which is the largest single consumer of energy on the planet. We must, to willfully misappropriate the right-wing rhetoric of Grover Norquist, quote, get it down to the size where we can drown it in the bathtub, end quote. 
Doing so will free up many resources for remaking our lives. Big agriculture, a huge polluter responsible for one third of global greenhouse emissions when the manufacturing of its inputs like fertilizers and pesticides and the processing of its outputs such as packaging, transportation and storage are included. Small scale human powered farming will likely be the stopgap, which will require a double digit percentage of the population to implement. Ultimately, however, a return to pre-agricultural food systems is the only truly sustainable option for a healthy planet. Meat eating. In the U.S., an astounding two-thirds of all cropland is devoted to growing feed for animals. These statistics don't speak to the barbaric cruelty of the meat and dairy industries or how our participation in the slaughter affects us culturally and personally by erecting a barrier to reconnecting with the planet in a truly respectful way. Private property. Currently, there are few limits in place to prevent property owners from destroying the ecosystem on their property. For many, many thousands of years, humans held land in common and stewarded it for the common good. This benefited not just humans, but also the other creatures who lived there and, most importantly, the land itself. The experiment in private property that began in European culture with the Enclosure Acts in England has been a failure and must be abolished. The Corporate Media the U.S. corporate news media forbids meaningful coverage of real issues. It must be stressed that this does not represent its failure. Rather, this is how it successfully plays its role as the bullhorn of fascism, and as such, it is irredeemable. The entertainment media is complementary, presenting stupidity as spectacle and burning an inordinate amount of resources to do so. Together, they create a false sense of reality, not merely by lying or spinning distractions, but by their insidious ability to trick the mind into thinking that illusion is real. As Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. The media itself, as media, fosters an obsession with abstraction and an attendant disconnection from the material. Moving pictures and text on a screen are not even as substantive as the smoke and mirrors of old. There is no there there. This is the brainwashing that the media accomplishes, a false perception that the unreal is real. The revolution will not be televised or streamed because it will be too deep, too sharp, and too dimensional for a form that is so shallow, so dull, and so flat. We won't miss it when it's gone, though. Thoughtless Childbearing an extreme decrease in the birth rate is an absolute necessity. Contraception, including freely chosen self-sterilization, must be universally available and strongly encouraged. Accompanying this, a dissolution of patriarchal family structures in favor of collective child-rearing and elder-tending will reintegrate generations and reinvigorate social vitality. This is only a partial list, offered as a taste, to give an idea of the scope of the challenge before us. It describes some of what would be necessary to embark on what John Michael Greer calls, quote, intentional technological regression, which is honestly the only choice that we have to make, though we aren't making it yet. How will such a revolution be sparked? Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So will a bottom-up grassroots movement of people stop fascism? I am pessimistic about the odds of that. More likely, in my opinion, is that the climate itself will be the agent, making the demand that cannot be ignored. Regardless, there will come a time, sooner or later, and probably sooner than most people would want, when the reality of climate change can no longer be denied, and its effects make our ability to carry on business as usual impossible. Then, ready or not, the revolution will be upon us. I would like to believe that, properly motivated, people have it in them to rise to the challenge. Quote, soft as butter they can be, and yet sometimes as tough as old tree roots. End quote. This is how Gandalf, the wizard, described hobbits in Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring. Perhaps this applies to humans, too. It's not like many people are happy with the status quo anyway. Most people are craving a different life with more meaning and purpose, even if these feelings are usually repressed and only come out in adolescent ways at the wrong targets when they are expressed. 
What do we do in the meantime? As much as I would personally like to see the above institutions toppled for the common good right now, it is beyond me or any reader here to do so. Yet we can embark upon the task of preparing ourselves. I suggest two ways of doing this, one outer, based on responding to the changing external circumstances, and the other inner, based on working on oneself. First, the outer, develop a skill. Fossil fuel burning machines and factories have been producing our necessities for many decades now, and the arts and crafts of living by hand are nearly lost, at least in the U.S. We must relearn how to grow food, build shelter, and make tools, among other things. Fortunately, such activities are rewarding in and of themselves, regardless of what the future brings and when. They can also help you to develop discipline and an attention to detail, which will be essential when things are different. I have a friend in Portland who, understanding that the status quo won't last forever and that different ways of living are likely to emerge in her own lifetime, has been teaching herself hand sewing. She has made many things, including garments and bags that are both useful and highly aesthetic. Additionally, much of her material is recycled or upcycled. I am the happy recipient of a pair of warm woolen slippers and a hooded cloak that were produced by her talented fingers. Come the revolution, people like her will keep clothes on our backs. Secondly, the inner work. Develop yourself. Start with the things you believe are important in your own life. Are they? Hampton declared work and school to be unimportant, and they are considered sacrosanct by many. What things are you holding on to as important that are far more trivial than those? Your appearance? Your high-tech toys? Your social status? The majority of people here in our techno-industrial culture are obsessed with nothing except the unimportant and the trivial. This is true for every class demographic and across the political spectrum. Attempt to liberate yourself from it. Even one small step away from it, if taken truly, will grant rewards, an increased clarity, and a greater ability to deal with change. It will also begin to alienate you from your peers, but keep in mind the sage words of Jiddu Krishnamurti, quote, It is no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society, end quote. Fascism is indeed profoundly sick, but it cannot stop you from pursuing your own way in your own inner self. Altogether now, Hampton stressed that the Black Panthers were not racist and that everyone who was aboard with the program was welcome regardless of their color. This is also true of the revolution to respond to climate change. The effects of climate change do not discriminate by color, creed, sex, or any of the other categories. Therefore, the revolution cannot discriminate by them and must welcome all willing participants equally Otherwise, it will fail. In the interest of fostering this real cooperation, people in the U.S. will need to dismiss their ridiculous cult of the individual. Giving it up will be a hard pill for some to swallow, though it has always been a fabrication anyway, born of an imperialistic privilege brought by committing genocide. The plain truth is that our personal differences don't make a difference in the big picture of salvaging survival from the mess that we've made. If any humans survive the coming upheavals, they will be flabbergasted that people in our time spent time worrying about who was buying our wedding cakes or who wouldn't sell us one. For the sake of our collective survival, we would benefit if we started dismantling these edifices of the indulgent ego immediately. The cloying claim that people are like snowflakes, that everyone is unique, is not a pretense we can uphold when what we need is an avalanche. Indeed, eventually people will find great relief in dismissing self-centered bootstrapping and embracing community-based collaboration. The former is a fantasy. The latter is authentic living. Climate change demands what King called a radical reconstruction of society itself, and, I would add, a radical reconstruction of the self. Personally, I yearn for both, and would be delighted for a teeming multitude of comrades in these causes to be one worker bee among many in the joyful labor of returning to free, healthy living on the buried bones of fascism. If you enjoyed this reading today, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. To find out about the other podcasting I do, visit radiofreesunroot.com.